first, or the evil of humanity will call for swift and decisive judgment. Then we have that second picture that happens here in verses 17 through 20, and it's of it's of uh, the it's of the great harvest. Uh, and what you see right here, it says in in uh, verse 18, that second part, it says, "Take your sharp sickle from the gather and gather the clusters of grapes from the earth's vine, because its grapes are ripe." The angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes, and threw them into the great wine press of God's wrath. They were trampled in the wine press outside the city, and blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as a horse's bridle for a distance of 1,600 stadia. So what we see happening here is that the word, no, I'll get to that in just a second, the word used in for ripe differs from the word that describes the harvest. Uh, this, that, that was there in verses 14 through 16. The term talking about the ripeness of the grapes means to be at the prime. One author writes, this vision draws off a common image in the world. Grapes were harvested at the peak of ripeness. They were put into a large vat where they were trampled and the juice would run out and be collected in an adjoining vat. So it's just like, like this picture right here. Uh, trampling out the vintage where the grapes are rather stored, uh, like the song that, that we just uh, mentioned. Um, what we see happening here is, and there's the imagery of a massive and bloody confrontation such as has not been seen on this earth, and this reveals an image uh, of the final battle of Antichrist and the kings of this earth against God, and that's what we would call Armageddon. And we're going to study this at length uh, when we get to chapter 16 and chapter 19. But presently, what we are given here is a short glimpse of what God's wrath will incur. So God's wrath will be poured out upon this earth, and it says in the text that the blood that will ensue from this battle will be the the will be 1600 stadia long and it will be as high as as a horse's bridle now the interesting thing one stadia is 660 feet or up to one eighth of a mile and so that is 180 miles that he's saying right here that it will, this this blood will cover 180 miles. It is is it any coincidence that from the northernmost part of the lands of Israel to the southernmost, that's 180 miles, right there. So what happens here in the text is that it says that blood will be as high in some portions as high as a horse's bridle. The Canaanites know about horses, you know, that's about four to six feet, right? Where the bridle is? Okay. I, I, I'm scared of horses. So you guys, you guys uh, kind of understand this a little bit better. But imagine that after the battle of Armageddon, the blood and the fluids that come from the animals and from all the, the bloodshed that occurs will be so high it will cover the land of Israel. Because all the kings, all the armies of the world will be gathered at that one place to try to fight against God's people and against God himself. And it will be actually be a, a campaign. And we'll be talking about this here in the next couple of weeks. It will be taken from different portions um, and, and judgment will be poured out all throughout the land of Israel. And so... It just gives you a graphic, graphic image of what that final battle will be like. And we'll discover that here in a, in a couple of weeks when we get into chapters 16 uh, through 19. Um, but the pictures that are used right here in chapter 14 just describe the harvest of the earth and the wickedness of man has grown up to such an extent that God says, we got to cut it down. We have to take care of because it's getting overripe. It's becoming unbearable of the the sites that are, are right here. Um, I it doesn't take much reading of the news to realize this world is overripe. It's getting bad. 
Um, let me just share with you some of the news that we're, we're seeing happening uh, in this past week. Like, for example, you know, we thought that we were done over there in, in the Middle East, but um, it says that one news report just this past week said that we're starting to stockpile weapons in Kuwait uh, once again for the eventuality that we're going to have to go back to Iraq again and try to clean up what is what is uh, happening over there with ISIS. So we thought that things were done and cleaned up, but it's just the eventuality of, of having to go back is it's it's almost certain. And so we're starting to stockpile weapons over there. Um, it's it's interesting. Also, uh, this past week, I was watching I was watching cartoons <laughs> with the kids on a. Uh, the Cartoon Network, and what, and it, and it was just shocking. I, I just saw they they had same sex parents in the cartoons. I'm like, what? Right in the cartoon, right there. And, and you're seeing that in Tylenol ads. You're seeing that in, in on, on cell phone commercials and things. And it's just becoming the norm today. Uh, you're seeing that today. Uh, it was interesting this past week. The Pope. Uh, came out and he gave out this interview to uh, this one magazine and he gave 10 suggestions how to live a happier and fuller life. And then on suggestion number nine, it was a real doozy. He said, what we need to do as Christians, we don't need to proselytize. He said, we need to respect other people's beliefs. You know, yeah, we do need to respect other people's beliefs, but he said this, that we can inspire others through witness so that one grows together in communicating. But the worst thing of all is religious proselytism, which paralyzes. That I am talking with you in order to persuade you. He says, no, each person dialogues starting with his or her own identity, and the church grows by attraction, not proselytizing, the Pope said. You know, the, the synonyms for proselytizing is witnessing, or it says... Converting, saving, redeeming, winning over, acting as a missionary, advocate. Why would the Pope say no, we don't need to be witnessing anymore? When in Scripture it says that we need to preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they keep to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. That hour is upon us right now. But we have amassed people who do not want to listen to the truth anymore. And you know what? We just need to be tolerant of everyone. That's happening right here, right now. It's also interesting, this past week, the news, the FBI said that 10% of America's 2,000 mosques have imams that are actively and regularly preaching jihad against America. Wow. So there's 200 churches out there that are training up another generation of terrorists, right here on our own soil. Not over there in Afghanistan, but it's right here in America. Uh, it says right here that a quarter of the Muslims in America ages 18 through 29 believe that suicide bombings can be justified according to the Pew Research Center poll. Now, if that is the case for America right here and right now, what do you think it's going to be like when the restraining influence of the Christians are gone after the rapture? What do you think it will be like on this earth when, when Christians are gone? Just take what's happening and just amp it up by a hundred. Joel chapter 3, verses 13 through 16, just indicates again what just repeats what happens right here in, in Revelation. I, I, I fear that we're, we've already lost a grip on this society. Things are, are collapsing quickly. And the harvest is getting overripe. And Joel chapter 3 says right here, this, it says, Swing the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come trample the grapes, for the wine press is full, the vats overflow. So great is their wickedness. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. 
For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon will be darkened and the stars no longer shine. The Lord will roar from Zion and thunder from Jerusalem. The earth and the heavens will tremble. But the Lord will be a refuge for his people, a stronghold for the people of Israel. God will have to judge. And, and when I when I there's a lesson that I when I read and study this text, and it's not an easy one to go through. But there's a lesson that I learned when I when I when I read this, and it's that we must all stand accountable for our actions. We must all stand accountable for the actions we commit in this life. Um, did I ever tell you that I once failed a breathalyzer test? You know, I, I, you know, Ross is here. He's the new sheriff in, in Dawson County. But let me explain to you before you run out and say, "Oh man, I'm not listening to the drunk preacher." No, this is what happens. <laughs> this is what happened. Um, I once drove the, the school bus for as a substitute uh, bus driver for the Plevna School District, and they called me one Monday morning and said that I needed to come down to the school, and, and there would be a, a police officer there to do a random drug screening for all of us, and, and so I got ready to throw on some clothes and garlic and Listerine, and then I'm down to the <laughs> down to the uh, the school, and they started doing all the standard things for me, you know, you know eye test, you know, fill this cup, whatever that they tell you to do. And uh, then they gave me this breathalyzer thing, and they said, I need you to puff into it for about two seconds, let up, and then it'll gauge, you know, what your blood alcohol limit is. And so I said, okay, that's good. So I, I blew into it, and the, the legal blood alcohol limit is 0 0.08, right? I think, okay, good. Mine came up 0.24 on that thing. That's, a, that's like three times the limit. Bruce. <laughs> and I'm like, what just happened? I'm like, I've never been drunk in my life. So what in the world occurred? And, and she's like, okay, we need to retake this. Maybe there's something wrong. Maybe the machine's not calibrated right. So she reset everything and I blew into it and I was like, oh man, it's worse. It came up to like 0.26 and I'm like, what is going on? And then it, it dawned on me, I just gargled with Listerine. And you know, Listerine has, you know, it's like, like, like a quarter of it is actual alcohol, alcohol. And so what was happening with the breathalyzer test is that I was blowing into it and then it was just Recording. Oh man, you've been you've been high on the vodka for the last <laughs> last couple hours. And what was interesting? She said, "Okay, um, what I need you to do is go over and and you just go rinse out your mouth." And I, I went over to the water fountain and I garbled and garbled and garbled and then finally came back after a couple minutes and then blew into it and then it registered at, at zero. And I was like, "Whew." I was just praying, Lord, please, you know, don't let me fail this test. And it was interesting, after it came up, she's like, uh, okay, you're safe. And she said to me that I would have, if you failed it the third time, I would have had to legally arrest you and place you into custody. You know, how would that have looked? <laughs> To the to the church, you know, that every time that somebody gets arrested in in, uh, in that county, that your name gets printed in the paper, and you know what your charges are, and it says you know Bruce Union arrested for being under the influence, uh, and so it was it was just crazy, and you know there was an examination for me, and I almost failed it. Why, you know, not purposefully, but almost ignorantly that that occurred and what I see happening here in this text is that God is holding everybody accountable he's saying I am placing before you a test and you may fail it or you may pass it we every single one of us 
we will be called before the final authority of the law, and we will be tested. Many Christians believe that because we're eternally saved by grace, we don't have to be the subject to the scrutiny of God. And this presents a distortion of the biblical teaching regarding Christians and judgment. Right here. This represents a distortion of the biblical teaching regarding Christians and judgment. It is true that there will be no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You know, when we have to take face God at the end of this age, we're not going to be there to be condemned. But, right there, and believers, we will be spared from suffering the wrath of God, according to the scripture. But scripture is also clear, however, that we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Paul expounds on this fact in more detail, and we must take these warnings seriously and personally. Your current joy and future reward are at stake. Look at these verses, and it's important that we read this in detail. It says, For no one today can lay any foundation other than the one that has already been laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though as one, only as one escaping through the flames. Second Corinthians 5.10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. When I read these texts, there is a day of examination coming for all of us. And I wrote here, and I fear that our success or lack of success in this examination will extend from the possibility that we didn't purposely want to lose out, but we ignorantly did so. Have I forgotten that there will be an accounting of all my works at the judgment seat of Christ? Revelation 2.23 says that I am he who searches the minds and hearts and I give according to each one of you according to your deeds. And so I have to examine my heart and say, Lord, am I, am I being a faithful steward of what you have given me? Am I being a faithful steward of the truth of your word? Am I being a faithful steward of all the blessings you have given me? There's that old hymn that says, Search me, O God, and know my heart today. Try me, O Savior, know my thoughts, I pray. See if there be any wicked way in me. Cleanse me from every sin and set me free. I ask you today, ask yourself that same question I asked me as I was studying this. Have I forgotten that there's going to be an accounting of all my works at the judgment seat of Christ? If you know today that, you know what, I kind of squandered what God has given me, and I want to turn my heart 100% over to Him, God is telling you, you have your chance. You have your opportunity. And turn to me and give me all of your heart before it's too late. I'm going to ask the worship team to come and they're going to lead us in one last closing song. And it's it's a song of surrender. And it's a song of saying, you can just come as you are. No matter what you have ever done or have ever experienced in your life, God just desires you 